Welcome to another how-to series video with Trend Micro. My name is Michael Clifford. I'm a support engineer here at Trend Micro, and I do things like Apex One New Feature Deployment Considerations Guides. <laughs> so let's get into it. So let's talk about the general deployment strategy of the new features involved with Apex One. Now everyone knows about the new features that are included, uh, application control, vulnerability protection, endpoint sensor. If you did it before, you do now. <laughs> uh, and once you get your hands on these, how do we want to initialize them? What Do you turn them all on and uh, let her rip? <laughs> I would say no. I, I would definitely advise against doing that. You can, you just uh, might run into some issues and then you'll be talking to me during normal business hours. So let's talk about a couple of the general deployment strategies we got going on. Uh, it is going to be a great idea to set up a, a pilot group and I'd like to make this uh, a fairly sizable pilot group, at least in regards to what your systems do in your environment. So if you have, you know, HR systems that have this, this set of software, and then you have payroll that has this set of software and developers over here, I would pick one to two out of each one of those groups uh, that indicate the environment at large that, that are a great sample group for that. I would then enable personally, uh, one of the features at a time and see how they react. I wouldn't go all the way and enable all three at one time. I would definitely turn on vulnerability protection first, scope it out for a day or so, uh, see if there's any reports. Uh, then I would turn on application control with a blank policy, see how that affects those systems. And then finally, if you have an endpoint sensor license, I'd turn that on and just uh, verify with the users that everything is good. This will let you validate the functionality of the new features on these types of systems with our, our new features that maybe you haven't had in your environment before. So that, that, that's the base deployment strategy for pilot groups. Once you're done with that pilot group and you feel like you're ready to move on, you got the whitelist in place, everything looks good, your application controls humming along in lockdown mode on those specific machines, you, you're gonna wanna take a very methodical approach. You don't wanna just deploy this to the rest of the machines and be like, everyone's the same, Every, everything is good. I, I would never do that. So to reduce the impact, after that validation, uh, you pick a larger group, not, not so much a pilot group, but you know, a phase deployment group and maybe, uh, you know, 50 or half or less, maybe 25% of the machines that those pilot groups, um, indicated that, that were part of that sample test group, I would send it out to them and then verify at a larger, larger group. And once those come back and verify any issues, uh, are resolved along the way, maybe you need to open a support case because you have a specific third party application that, that hooks into something that causes. IAC to, to cause issues with that application. Who, who knows? Who knows? There's a lot of stuff out there, almost an infinite amount of variables. But once you get through all that, that's the point in which you deploy to the rest of your, your systems. Definitely do any of these options out on off peak hours. Application control is, is a big one for this. Definitely do during off peak deployment. And we'll talk about that very specifically in a minute. So all these deployments for the new features are done through Apex Central Policy Management. If you're still utilizing your Office Scan or uh, you know for your your deployments, then the transition to Apex Central is going to be imperative. Getting used to that policy management system is going to save you time, get, give you the ability to audit, and allow you to deploy the new features altogether. Uh, another big, big note on this general deployment strategy is the integrated products, such as integrated application control, will uninstall their standalone counterparts. If you had an older version, let's say an older version of standalone vulnerability protection, uh, it may not even be able to uninstall it. And the Apex Central will tell you that it can't uninstall that old agent, so it might require some manual intervention. So let's talk about the specific products and maybe some of the things that go along with that technically. We have the integrated vulnerability protection up first. Now, this is uh, one that I would, like I stated, uh, I, I would initialize first because it's a very low impact feature. Um, I haven't had any real problems with it uh, from my current support experience when enabling this one. The only thing I've seen is the maximum TCP connection, concurrent connection, uh, hitting, it, hitting that maximum, the default maximum. So if you're an administrator, there's a potential you have a lot of TCP connections open, or maybe their users have a lot of TCP connections open for various reasons, such as connecting to Azure resources, or uh, there so many reasons. I would just validate how many 
your environment needs to have. So by default, it's a thousand. It's a little low, uh, especially for modern standards. It's not, it's not too terribly low, but <laughs> uh, I could definitely breach that within uh, any given moment of time on my personal machine. So uh, just verify what that is and make sure to set that. It won't block the connections per se. However, uh, it actually depends whether you're, you're in security or performance uh, modes, but it, it will start logging and it'll start giving you a lot of logs if you maintain that 1000 current connections on the TCP. So verify it and set it appropriately for your environment and uh, just negate that altogether. And this would be done within your pilot group, I'm sure. So one other thing with the vulnerability protection rules, uh, we they are completely maintained by Trend Micro and we disperse them through pattern updates. It is very important to have your agents updating regularly and often because these patterns are the conglomeration of our research on a global scale and it's important to have these up to date. So there's no manual additions to IVP rules. This type of stuff is relegated towards suspicious objects and things of that nature. So the, the rules that are currently in that pattern set are easily enabled or disabled uh, via the Apex Central policy. Um, there are approximately 200 uh, rules within the performance mode set, and there's about 400 in the security set, and the security set also has a more vigorous uh, block <laughs> on it than the performance set. That's pretty much it for vulnerability protection in regards to its impact on deployment. Now on to integrated application control. So the initial default deployment allows all applications to run. So you set it up, you deploy the feature, and if you don't mess with anything else, it, all applications are allowed to run, and there may not even be default criteria assigned to it so you can assess. So to set up an application criteria, uh, you do that via the policy. You could set a specific piece of software to block and set it to assessment mode, and that'll allow you to evaluate all the logs coming in on users utilizing that specific piece of software. So when you're setting up the criteria, the application control criteria within the Apex Central policy, and you wanna get it out of assessment mode, all you would do is change it from block and assessment. I think there's a checkbox if I remember off the top of my head at the moment. <laughs> uh, it would stop that specific application from executing. You can enter in a whole bunch of different stuff uh, into the criteria to block that application, whether it be a hash, a path, uh, certificate details, uh, we have a huge safe soft, uh, certified safe software list you could select from in the grayware spyware list. So you could set those to block and it'll block them once you assign that criteria to the rule within the policy. If you select lockdown mode, <clears throat> which is the real beauty of application control, an inventory scan will be triggered. You don't wanna do this to all machines and you especially don't wanna do this during business hours. It's a very resource intensive scan that goes through and finds all the applications on the current machine and creates an inventory database on the agent itself. All applications not inventoried that time by default will be assessed and the logs will start coming in. Now we have widgets for it and you can evaluate what users are doing outside of that inventory scan, what programs are trying to download and run and all that stuff. And this gives you a period of time to evaluate that, that specific set of data and either create allow criteria for, for those specific programs or determine that it's time to lock it down because they shouldn't be running these. And then you just uh, turn off the assessment mode via checkbox, redeploy the policy, and there you go. It's done. They can't run that application anymore. So the trusted program list and the allow criteria that you develop are the two ways in which you can bypass the, the inventory lockdown. So keep that in mind if you need to allow something either company-wide would be great trusted programs list or individual users, a new rule with the allow criteria. Uh, th those are great methods for, for doing that. All right, now on to the integrated endpoint sensor. Our biggest new feature is the EDR, the endpoint detection and response, and our MDR, the managed detection and response. Both of these absolutely require endpoint sensor to function properly. The only real thing to say about endpoint sensor uh, from a technical perspective of deployment is that it does increase the resource consumption on the endpoint by a, a fairly significant amount. Not, not overwhelming, but it is, it is higher. It does quite a bit of recording. It does IOC sweeps, IOA. It, it, it's, it, it does a lot of things that require a lot of CPU. And that's really what it comes down to, CPU and memory. <laughs> So the requirement for endpoint sensor raises the minimum requirements of the agent 
by about 20%. So they also have a local database in which they record the events and the size of that database is determined by the policy assigned to the agent. So this can be set to five gigabytes if you want to have a very large amount of data recorded for any particular event or house you know, older events so you can do historical uh, searches uh, beyond metadata. However, I mean, that, that's just gonna adjust the amount of disk space needed by the agent. Uh, the other part of the endpoint sensor, I know we've mentioned it a couple times before, is that you do need full SQL 2016 with full text search enabled, 2016 or above. So that these are the only real considerations on the deployment of endpoint sensor. Can your systems handle the system requirements or can they not? Do you want EDR or do you not? Uh, other than that, it's not really a, a difficult product to manage. Uh, you don't have many options with it. It's just there doing the endpoint sensor things and allowing you to functionally do detection and response. All right, so that gives you an idea of some of the different considerations to go under before you start deploying all the new features. I guess the biggest takeaway is don't deploy everything to all endpoints all at once as soon as you upgrade to Apex One. <laughs> uh, that's, really, that's really it. All right, guys, till our next video. Bye.